Good morning, Magic. It's Tuesday, April 14th, 2020, and I'm here to talk with you more about Aquaria. And it's not just me this time. You know, it takes a long time to make a magic set, especially one, one with as much going on as Aquaria. And someone who was instrumental in creating that set was Dave Humphreys. Dave, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dave Humphreys. I am a game design architect. I led the set design for Aquaria. Um, before that, I'd led the set design for War of the Spark and Dominaria. And before that, I did final design for a bunch of sets dating all the way back to Avacyn Restored. And let's not forget one of your crowning achievements from back in the day. By being a pro player, you got your very own pro player card. That's just sweet. Anyway, you're basically the guy behind the final version of Aquaria, so I want to cut right to the chase and ask one of the hottest questions on people's minds. What's up with Companion? How did it come to be? What's the design story there? How much was it tested? Was it tried in other formats? Uh, tell me about it. We spent a lot of time with Companion. Uh, we, as usual, spend most of our time playtesting standard and limited environments. Spend a lot of time theory crafting what would happen in uh, older formats, um, what decks these cards would most likely go into, or there ways we could tweak the design so that they weren't as impactful for some of those decks. Um, we were very concerned about... Um, replayability. I mean, certainly one of the hopes is that this would, um, you know, there's game to game replayability and there's just replayability of kind of formats in general. Our hope was that this would lead to some new decks um, springing up rather than um, bolstering um, pre-existing decks. Certainly was the hope that might not be the case in every format. Um, but the, the idea is even, even within a game in terms of replayability, we hope to, we kept trying to make modifications to design so that you wouldn't necessarily always play the card on the same turn. It wouldn't always interact with the same other cards. That there, there could still be a lot of replayability within a game, even though you always have access to the same card. I mean, a lot of formats, you're often searching for cards or um, playing a lot of card filtering and shuffling effects to get to cards. So a lot of games have cards being played somewhat consistently anyways. Um, so we, we were just trying to bring up new decks that would um, just create really new possibilities and, and work with designs that wouldn't necessarily um, lead to the same game states over and over. Um, you know, Lutri is the extreme example that's not even really a fair example, which is that, you know, you're playing Singleton, which is going to offset any sort of replayability. But a lot of our cards were hoping that some of the power in those cards is interacting with other cards and the cards that they're interacting with are going to change from game to game. So you mentioned Lutri, and I'm glad you did. It's been the topic of a lot of discussion. It was previewed and then banned in Commander immediately. Were you expecting that? Have you talked with the rules committee ahead of time? Were you intending for this to get played in Commander? What's the history here? The general impetus of the companion mechanic was to build in deck building restrictions um, that you wouldn't normally be expected to be doing. So for Lutri, we did not expect that that would be played um, in singleton formats that um, yeah, we just assumed that it would not be legal there since there's no deck building cost that you're playing, paying in singleton formats. Uh, we did talk with the rules committee and had some back and forth with them about our recommendations and what we thought made the most sense. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. It sounds like when you were designing Lutri, you knew that it would kind of defeat the point of Companion in Commander. Every blue and red deck in Commander forever could just play it without any cost. It's just the rules of the format, which defeats the whole deck building point of these cards. You showed it to the rules committee, and they were also on board with axing it, and so the set came out, and the card was banned immediately. Yeah, that makes total sense. Before we get off the topic of Companion, one other thing I'd like to talk about. I know there was a lot of work behind the scenes in getting all these restrictions just right, make sure they're all verifiable. What were some of your favorite companions that were left on the cutting room floor? One, you had to play all cards of the same rarity, which would have been probably a logistical nightmare, but it was really fun to think about. I think would have been cool um, if it were easier to make work. Um, we had one card that I, I believe in the end you had to play a monocolor deck and none of the cards in your deck could share a mana cost. So if you had a card that cost one R, you would not be able to play another card. You'd have to find a card that cost RR instead if you wanted to fill out that slot in your deck. Um, that was pretty fun. Um, and yeah, we, we had a, a lot, a slew of other things like, you know, be, before we worried as much about verifiability, things that you had to play like four cards at each converted mana cost from zero to 10 and, and wacky things like that. Um, so th there was a lot of fun stuff that didn't quite make it through. Oh yeah, I remember the Rarity Companion. It was super cool. You could play like a popper deck with all commons, that could be your commander. Or if you were really baller, you could go all mythic rares. There was a lot of fun stuff to do. I mean, I get why I didn't quite make it. It's a little wonky, but maybe someday, Dave, maybe someday. I'm there with you on this one. 
One other big question I've gotten about Aquaria is the three color nature of the set. So it's wedges in particular and three color. Why do that here? What's the story behind that design decision? We planned pretty far in advance that we wanted three colors um, to shine here. Uh, we had the advantage of Ravnica the year before with uh, strong two color cards and a good mana base from provided by the Shocklands. Uh, so this is a good chance to um, make three color cards to excite people and yet not worry about them possibly dominating for too long since we'd have rotation taking those cards out of the environment. Um, we talked about Wedge mostly just in terms of um, there, there's still a lot more support to give wedges that we had not given as much to as compared to shards in the past, and certainly shards will have their time to shine in some future set. Okay, so we can't talk about three color without also talking about the triumphs. These are probably the best three mana producing lands of all time. How did they come to be? What's the history there? Why do they have the land types? And fess up, were they ever meant to be the other half of the Amonkhet cycling lands? When we're planning out lands for sets, we actually pencil in way ahead of time um, what lands are going to make sense with each set, like kind of figure out the, the cadence and flow of lands in and out of standard. So we, we knew that we wanted to do tri-lands here for a very long time before this, especially since we knew we wanted to um, promote three color decks more so than the normal. Um, we, we did look at, once we had cycling, we, you know, we made sure that we shouldn't be just finishing out the Amonkhet cycle, but um, we wanted to play up three color decks and putting on the basic land types here just felt like something that, that we could do without adding much power to standard while making them exciting for some of our eternal formats. And yeah, I agree with that. It's better to make the right design decision, making a land that taps for all three colors in a wedge set, than to just check a box by making the other half of the Amonkhet cycling lands. Although I'm sure we'll make the other half of the Amonkhet cycling lands someday. So let's keep going through the mechanics here. Yesterday I talked some about Mutate and how it came to be in design and some of the versions that were played with back then, but then the set was handed off to you and things changed a little bit. What were the changes you made to Mutate and why? At the end of Vision Design, uh, when it was handed off to set design, uh, Mutate only uh, was allowed over a creature that shared a keyword or a creature type with the creature you were mutating with. Um, and it only um, gained any keywords in the form of keyword counters of the, the creature that you were mutating over. Uh, the first big change we did um, was letting you keep all of the text of the card that you were mutating over. Um, but th things were still really complicated in draft and narrow and constructed deck building. So we opened that up to the letting you just mutate over any non-human creature. We felt that was still good enough in terms of the creative. Um, and then finally, we let you mutate under just um, so that you didn't have to worry about sequencing to end up with your biggest creature on top that you we would just let you keep whatever best stats um, or other characteristics of the card that you wanted. Let's keep the mechanics train rolling. Keyword counters. What was the inspiration there and how did you decide to use them? The inspiration for keyword counters came um, for me, at least while I was working on Amonkhet block and trying to figure out the punch out cards for those. Um, and I, I just felt like there was a lot of space that you could open up by using counters to represent uh, what keywords creatures could be getting in a persistent way that would be different from other cards we've done in the past. Okay, let's see, companion, mutate, wedge, keyword counters, lots of other stuff going on. Dave, a lot of people have noticed how complex this set is. How much did you notice that in design and is this a new normal for Magic? Coria certainly is a more complex set than usual by any reasonable metric. Uh, we were certainly aware of this. Um, can say that almost all the mechanics that we looked at had been conceived of years ago. Um, it wasn't that we were just trying to play up um, new opportunities here with Arena, that these were all mechanics we thought would be perfectly reasonable on paper. All of the play design, play testing, and all the work done on the cards um, before the set is kind of pens down is all done um, in paper. So certainly we felt like this was all, all reasonable. We knew it was approaching the upper ends and upper bounds of um, what, what we should be doing in terms of complexity. Um, and you know, I, I wouldn't take this as some new normal in terms of where, where you should expect future magic to be, but um, we, we thought it was worth it to go all in on making, making the coolest uh, wildest monsters. And I'd say you definitely succeeded. The monsters in the set are amazing, especially these alternate art creatures, which I had to put full on the screen just because they are that gorgeous. I really appreciate you having me on the team. It was great working with you on this one, and I can't wait for players to play the set. It is a blast. 
Thank you so much, Dave, for taking the time to come on today and spending it with all of us. If you have any questions for Dave at all, you can find him on Twitter at Grumfreeze. I'm sure he'd love to hear all of your Aquaria related thoughts. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of Good Morning Magic. In the meantime, good luck, have fun, and enjoy brewing with all of Aquaria. You got this.